Good morning, and happy Resurrection Sunday. Uh, sometimes people will scold you if you use the word Easter because it's not a Bible word. I say get over it. We know what you mean. We know what you meant. Um, I'll use uh, I'll use a Bible word for you. Happy Anastasia Sunday. Amen. Yes. Anastasia is the Greek word for resurrection. Now, I'm not talking about that gal named Anastasia that you know. I'm talking about the Greek word for resurrection. It's a combination of two words in the Greek language. The prefix ana, A-N-A, meaning repeat or again. And stasis or stasis meaning to stand. So literally it means standing up again. So we're celebrating standing up again. First his, Amen. then ours. Amen? Amen. All right. And that is the focal point of Resurrection Sunday. It's the confidence we have that on that day, should we pass away before he returns, there are some that won't, but we don't know, and be laid low in the grave, we will one day stand up again. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to that. Now, as to the resurrection of Jesus Christ on this day, as I mentioned, you can call it Easter, you can call it Resurrection Sunday, but whatever you do call it, the only real question is this, and I want to focus on something that happened before the empty tomb. It's when Jesus is nailed to the cross and on either side of him there is another crucifixion taking place. He was crucified with a criminal on either side. And he said something very interesting to one of these fellows. And uh, Somewhere along the way, the Holy Spirit got to one of those two guys. The only way you know who Jesus is is the Holy Spirit revealed him to you, same way Peter knew, same way you and I know. We didn't wake up one morning and get suddenly smart and say, I know, Father, Jesus did. Unless the Spirit of God reveals him to you, and then you just stop saying no, and you go, okay, I get it. That guy on that day, he got it, and he didn't have a lot to say, but what he said brought forth a most wonderful response from Jesus, one that uh, we should all take to ourselves. I think we can do that. He said to him, uh, I tell you the truth, assuredly, today you will be with me in paradise. From what I understand about paradise, I've not been there, but I understand, I know it's a town in Pennsylvania. This is better than that one. Uh, the paradise of God is the way things used to be before sin entered in. It's the way everything was, and mm -hmm. it was just a beautiful, beautiful thing until uh, free will took over in, in the fall. Today, you will be with me in paradise. I know there's some that teach that when you pass away, in fact, it's one of the distinctives of our denomination, is that uh, you fall asleep in the Lord and you stay asleep until he raises you up at the resurrection. Many in the Advent Christian denomination would say that that is coincidental with the second coming because they don't subscribe to the rapture. I'm gonna prove that wrong today. When Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, he didn't mean, but you won't know it because you'll be asleep until the resurrection, but you'll be there. No, he meant today, you will be consciously, with, I'm going to paradise today, I'm taking you with me. That's exciting stuff. So the only question is this, when Jesus said that to the criminal on the cross, do you believe that A, he was serious about that, and B, that he was able to make that happen? I say yes. I say yes and amen. Now that exchange between the criminal on the cross and Jesus, it gives us one of the most actually one of the most important doctrines of Christian faith. And uh, the idea of salvation by grace and not of works. This fellow didn't have time to do anything. He had time to make one statement, and it was a good one, apparently. Good enough for, for the Lord. And so, uh, this day we celebrate the promise of us with him one day in paradise on that very day that we leave this life. That's where you're going to be, if you believe the Word of God. 
So that then begs the question, and you look around at people you know, friends, relatives, coworkers, whatever, and you go, okay, well, why me and not him? Why me and not her? I don't know. There's a sense in which we choose. There's a sense in which he chooses us. How much of it is him? How much of it is us? I don't think anybody really knows. I just say thank you and stand at post. Amen. Amen. So is it because of what we've done? Is it because we're such wonderful people? I remember we had back in decades ago when we were at uh, Disciples of Christ Church, which we didn't realize the liberal nature of the denomination, which is why we ultimately left it. Um, one of the things that they would ask one of the elders to do on, on Easter Sunday, and I use the word deliberately, is to uh, give us a little dissertation on what Easter means to you. And one of our elders said, well, I believe that God looked down upon the earth to see if we were worth saving. And he decided that we were. So he sent his son mm -hmm. to the cross. Oh, he decided we were worth it. We're so unworthy. We're so completely unworthy of what Jesus did for you and for me. I hope you know that. And I hope you just say thank you because you can't earn that kind of love. People think wrongly that human beings are basically good. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that God says the heart of man is evil only continually. And that was pre-flood, but it didn't change after the flood, by the way. Human nature has never changed. And so we're not all basically good. People think that. People think, well, we're all God's children, so we'll all end up in paradise, right? Bible doesn't teach that either. Read the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 1. You only get the authority, the right to call yourself a child of God once you believe in Jesus. So there's a lot of misconceptions about who's going to paradise and how they're going to get there. Do we get there because of what we believe, because of what we subscribe to, because of our depth of theological knowledge, all the things we've studied and the books we've read and spent time in the New Testament. You know, the criminal on the cross never spent a, a minute in the New Testament. He may have read the old one, I don't know. But he didn't have what we have. And so sometimes we think that we're so theologically adept. We're, we're good, we're even good at exegetical hermeneutics. Look that one up sometime. <laughs> How exegetical were the her hermeneutics of this fellow on the cross? He, he didn't know a whole lot. He had no deep theological understanding of much of anything. Uh, he knew and confessed the only thing that anyone needs to know. That we, like the criminal, are deserving of death. It is the wages of sin. In other words, we are sinners deserving of death. And by the way, this man, Jesus, the criminal said, this man has done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. Done nothing wrong. Jesus on the cross was the first human being ever executed who was completely innocent, 100% innocent. So here's this criminal on the cross. He had some understanding of the concept of resurrection because he revealed that when he prayed to Jesus, remember me when you what? Come into your kingdom. Oh, he's going to stand up again? Yes, he's going to be alive. I don't know how he grasped that, except the Holy Spirit must have revealed it to him, because there wasn't any precedent for him to know. All three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell us that those who were crucified with him, initially at least, they all reviled him. The two of them reviled him. And so I want to suggest that in life, people will either revile Jesus, or they will trust him and believe in him, one or the other. There is no spiritual Switzerland. There's no neutral ground. I thought I was safe as an agnostic. Well, I don't have to commit. I'll just kind of suspend judgment and wait and see. Jesus said something interesting, which I had not read at that point. He said, uh, he who is not with me is against me. 
So you may run into people to say, well, I don't, I haven't put my faith in Jesus, but you know, it doesn't matter. I've got time, maybe not, maybe not. Matthew 12, 30, he who's not with me is against me and who does not gather with me scatters. So you're either working with him or you're working against him. There's no, no in between. So how did this career criminal in his dying moments come to believe? How did that happen? For him, well, how does anyone come to believe? How did you come to believe? Hope you do. If you did, how'd that happen for you? I think it's a way that God uses the circumstances of our lives combined with the unction of the Holy Spirit to convict us that at some point, his grace is so overwhelmingly obvious to us, we can no longer deny it. So why was this king crucified between two criminals. There are so many fulfillments of the Old Testament during Holy Week, it just scads of them. We could spend a couple of days just going through them. But let's just zero in on that one. Why is he there in the middle and a criminal on either side? Isaiah 53 and verse 12. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now I realize what Isaiah is alluding to there is that his sacrifice, his pouring out of his soul unto death was for you and me. We're the transgressors. But it also points to the fact that he happened to be crucified between two well-known transgressors, two criminals, and he was numbered with them on that day. So it's another fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. And I noticed that his intercession for the criminal on the cross was effective immediately. Not on some future date when he would return in his glory, but on that day. Today, he said, you will be with me in paradise. Today. And, and so on this Anastasia Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, we know, we know. And, and by faith, we know and we are confident because faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. Faith is sure and certain. If you're not sure you're saved, you're not saved. Because faith is sure and certain. And, and, and you didn't save yourself. And, and you have to know that when God touches you and brings you to a place where you receive the Holy Spirit and you get born again, you have no doubt. You have no doubt. Now, I had conversations with some folks, in, again, back in the Disciples Church decades ago, and I, I suspected that there were a number of people in the congregation who attended church on a regular basis and were not saved, were not born again, in fact. And I was concerned about that, and I asked one of our ladies, uh, do you believe that when you die, you will go to be with Jesus? You'll go to heaven, however you want to put it. And her response was, I hope so. You understand the voice inflection, and I hope so, like, could be, could be not. I don't know. That's not faith. That's not saving faith. Here it is, 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So we are always what confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. If the Lord were to call you home right now, how many of you would say, that would make me happy. I'd be okay with that. I knew that hand would go up. <laughs> Come quickly, Lord Jesus, is the cry of the church at the very end of this book, if you read about it. We're looking forward to that. So we know we're confident, therefore, that he who said to the criminal on the next cross that he would be with him in paradise that day has spoken also to us who believe, and we know that he is the king of kings. He is coming into his kingdom. And by faith, we're gonna be with him. Try to imagine, if you will, 
as this fellow did, asking the King of Glory to remember you. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Interesting request, isn't it? Well, why should he? Why should he remember you? To paraphrase what Jesus was saying to this fellow, he said, though you will die this day and be laid low in the grave, you will stand up again. That's resurrection, that's Anastasia. And on that day when we stand up again, where will we find ourselves standing? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, I can't really find a, an in-depth description uh, of paradise, but we'll, we'll come to that when we get to the revelation. A little bit of it in there. But uh, why should he remember you and me? Are we that memorable? <laughs> I can't sometimes remember what I had for breakfast this morning or dinner last night. Jesus is going to remember me of all the people that ever breathed on this planet. That's what the fellow requested. Why should he? Considering all that we should have done and have not done. Considering all of those things which we have done and should not have done. Why should he remember us? We're just like the fellow on the cross. Or the scripture says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are deserving of death. All are deserving to reap the wages of sin. All. So why me? Why would I get that promise? Now, some people will believe that one day they will stand before God and try to convince him that, you know what? Nobody's perfect. Amen. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. We're all flawed in some way. And after all, I'm a pretty good guy. God probably can't wait to get me in his kingdom. I'll be such a wonderful addition to I'm pretty good, relatively speaking. I'm not as good as some, but I'm better than others, right? Understand what sin is, just as we're to understand what resurrection means. Sin, by God's definition, means literally to miss the mark. That's what it means, hamartia, to miss the mark. Coming close doesn't cut it. Remember the old saying, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an expression that emphasizes being close to a goal or a target is not the same as, exact, as actually reaching that goal or target. Now in horseshoes, if you just get close to the stake, you can still get some points. Mm -hmm. And in hand grenades, being close to the target can still have an effect. But when it comes to righteousness in the sight of holy God, being close is not sufficient. A miss is as good as a mile. Criminal on the cross, I think he got that. He understood that. It says this about that moment. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, meaning blasphemed Jesus, saying, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you're under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me. Great request. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So where are we going to find ourselves standing up again on that day? Paradise. I believe it. Paul got a, a trip to paradise one time. He, he was in a vision or it was real. He's not really sure because it seemed really real. He was. It says this, that uh, he was caught up to the third heaven. In case you wonder where it is. See, we've got the first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. People say, what about seventh heaven? There is none. First heaven is the atmosphere, if you will. Second heaven is the stratosphere, if you will. Third heaven is where God dwells. Okay. Caught up to the third heaven, that's where paradise is. It used to be in Sheol, but God moved it when Jesus uh, ascended. He took it with him. He led captivity captive. He took it with him. Paradise now has been relocated to the third heaven. Paul gets a vision, and he wakes. He, he's in his vision. He's in paradise. And he sees things that are like astounding, amazing, awesome. And then God says, but you can't tell anybody. 
You know how many people out there are making money writing books about their trip to heaven and what it was like? And, you know, Jesse Duplantis telling us that he rode on a motorcycle with Jesus and all this other stuff. And don't waste your money. Don't waste your time. Paul was caught up to paradise and was told, don't tell anybody what it was like. You can't. You can't tell it them. So, um, by the way, caught up to paradise, caught up to the third heaven. Guess where we find that word in, in one other place? 1 Thessalonians 4 and 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be what? Caught oh. up, same word, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Sounds good to me. That's quite comforting. Caught up. Where? To paradise. What's it going to be like in paradise? Let me tell you. I'm going to tell you what it's going to be like. Not moment to moment or what you're going to be doing. Uh, we don't know that. But John gives us a glimpse of what it's like in his revelation. He says this. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then he goes on to say this, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, listen to those words, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Sounds good? Yeah. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Not because of what you have done or have not done, but because of who I am. It's the central message of Resurrection Sunday. It's the word hope. Hope. Cheerful, confident expectation. Not like that lady I talked to. Gee, I hope so. No, no. Bible hope means you confidently cheerfully look forward to and expect that to happen for you. And that's why his resurrection is our hope. The hope is that on that day when you and I leave this life, if we have understood and acknowledged who he is, as the criminal did, in just a few words, Jesus will make sure that on that day you will be with him in paradise. It's a great, great promise. So we celebrate Resurrection Sunday because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is our hope. Apart from the resurrection, we have no hope. We ain't going nowhere. But because the tomb is empty, because he ascended, because he's coming again to receive us to himself, we have hope. Christmas is great. Love it, love it, love it. But if it didn't lead us here, what was the point? Yeah. I'll end with this word from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to what? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You have a reservation. You know, some places you can't get in without a reservation. Well, you have a reservation. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Party of one. <laughs> That's how you go in. And then he, he, he says this, Peter writes this. He says, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Can I get 